I am joined today by a special guest, Isaac Bovey, and he's the Director of Product Management at Excellion. And we want to spend a few minutes today talking with him about passwords. And we're going to get some insight into maybe where passwords that we're currently familiar with and where are they really going and what does that mean for us as as users, as business owners, and how we can uh, get a few takeaways from this. And uh, Isaac, I wanted to, to welcome you to this uh, audio podcast and uh, wanted to see maybe we can get a little bit of background so our, our listeners can get a sense of who you are and some of the things that you do at Excellion. Thank you very much, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so I'm Director of Product Management here at Excellion, and I have a focus on governance and security. So part of this is you know, security inherent in the product, how we encrypt user data, how we protect your data. Uh, and a big part of it is actually security integrations. So with large enterprises, you'll actually have a lot of security products already in place. And uh, Excellion will integrate with those security products, providing another layer for, for your content. So this could be integrations uh, with Active Directory or LDAP or other directory services for user identification and authentication, or integrations with uh, single sign-on systems, uh, again, for user authentication and, and identification as well as integrations with content security. So for data loss prevention systems, uh, you know, services that look at the content uh, as it goes through uh, Excellion, uh, it verifies, you know, is this sensitive content, you know, or is this okay to be shared publicly uh, and, and behaves accordingly. Uh, we do integrations with adaptive threat prevention systems as well. So as content comes into the corporation, we can send it off to check for malware, you know, do determinations, do uh, detonation as well. So, you know, my day is spent, you know, a, a lot of it is interfacing with, you know, engineering, making sure that the product's on track, uh, you know, that we're really building the product that the market needs. And then the other half of my day is, you know, with sales, with sales engineers, uh, you know, with with marketing and looking at the direction of the market itself, you know, doing research, mm -hmm. seeing where all these technologies are headed. In a sense, there's kind of data that we share maybe with with the public that's kind of out there versus there's some private data that that perhaps we want to keep protected, be it maybe it's uh, intellectual property, maybe it's whatever, lo login information, financial information, so on and so forth. When we, we think about protecting it and sorting it, it may, maybe help us understand how, how your platform there, what you guys offer at Excellion can help differentiate that from a user perspective. I, absolutely. And so we really focus on external file sharing. Mm -hmm. So the use case that, that, that we have is exactly as you said, you, you have content you know, in your environment and it, and it goes both ways. You need content from external users or you need to share that internal content uh, out to external users. And you could have, you know, content in SharePoint. You could have content in Documentum. You know, it could be in network shares. You could even have content on Box, you know, Google Drive, Office 365 out in the cloud. And we provide a way, you know, in a whole framework to allow you to, to share that content externally. Uh, so, you know, you, you need to get it out to a consultant, um, you know, to uh, a, an external party, a, a business partner, or just out to the public. Um, you also want to put uh, controls in place so that as you have your employees sharing that content, exactly as you said, that, you know, IP or, you know, PII, uh, you know, social security numbers, things aren't sent to the wrong person. Uh, so we have security integrations to, to as that content's leaving the environment, you know, before it's available for the external user, uh, it goes through a security check, it goes through, you know, data loss prevention, whatever security systems you have in place, and gets the okay, okay, this content's okay to share, or this content should remain in, internal. Uh, with external sharing, you also have content coming into your environment you can do the similar checks for, you know, sensitive information, but there 
you know, the, the concern really is malware or viruses coming into your environment. So do very similar checks on inbound content. But this time, you know, we have a, a built-in AV process or send it out to uh, an ATP service such as Checkpoint, do the checks there, and then, you know, quarantine that content, uh, alert your administrators uh, so they can take a closer look at what's going on before they allow any users to access it. Passwords are problematic. They're hard to remember. Uh, they're tough to maintain. Do you write them down in sticky notes and what tricks work? Do we make them long and strong? All this goes on year in, year out. And yet again and again, breach after breach, we find that I guess people are creatures of habits. And I was wondering if maybe you could comment and share some of your thoughts. How do we get beyond this point, beyond just these problematic breaches because of password reuse and weak passwords and all the other things that are fundamental to, to the, the breach year after year? The issue is that passwords, people are creatures of habit, and passwords are hard to remember. And I mean, the, the biggest issue, well, let's set aside the, the issue with default passwords, because I think, you know, we're sure, going to hear sure. a lot about that, you know, especially with the Internet of Things, you know, absolutely. If you get, you know, a new device, if you get a home router, first thing you do, change that password. So pushing that aside, uh, users tend to reuse the same password. They, they'll have that that password that they know and they'll use it across services. And then it's easy to remember. They don't have to remember, you know, oh, OK, for this service, this this is the password I'm using. The danger there is, you know, if the service is compromised, uh, if they're subject to a phishing attack and they give that password up now, you know, now the hacker could get access to multiple systems that they, they have access to. So you've been using that same password for, you know, your corporate login, you've been using it for your bank account, you've been using it for your online email account, uh, a phishing attack, you know, you, you foolishly click on the link to reset your password, and the, the hacker now has that password, they can just go through systematically and, you know, see, hey, can I get access to, to this person's bank account? Can I get access to this person's uh, work environment? So number one, you know, password complexity, uh, the, the rules in place have made people more susceptible to just come up with a good, clever password that they have memorized and reuse it system after system after system. I came across an interesting stat. And this was a, a recent one from a, a thousand respondents by uh, Keeper Security. They brought out, as a result of this survey, more than 80% of folks ages 18 and up reuse the same password across multiple accounts. And it really speaks to your point there because it, it, it once you have that unique password that you finally find a way to remember, you think it's really strong it's hard to create multiple passwords so you tend to reuse that foolishly thinking hey this will keep me safe but as you pointed out it's extremely dangerous maybe you can comment on uh, we hear often about multi-factor authentication two-factor authentication and this is often provided by many of the tech giants be it uh, Facebook or uh, logins for for email this and that it's very common. How effective and how secure is two-factor authentication, in your opinion, uh, Isaac? When you talk about two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, uh, it's going to the, the factors are going to be you know something you know, and that's generally a password, you know, or it could be a PIN. Uh, something you are, which would be a biometric identifier. Mm -hmm. Or something you possess and that's generally you know a soft token or a hard token uh, so by adding a second factor you know if we go back to to the situation where your password's been compromised you know maybe it is a shared password you know maybe you did did something wrong there but by adding that second factor you have protected those services so the hacker you know has your password they'll enter your password and now they're prompted for a one-time password or they're prompted for a fingerprint and you've just put that that boundary in there that 
it's going to take them more to, to get across that. Uh, one of the interesting things with with 2FA that has actually come up recently, and it depends on, you know, your comfort level, you know, what you're protecting, is uh, a lot of older systems will use uh, SMS uh, uh-huh. for, for the second factor, so your, your phone number. And, and we really need to move beyond that. Um, you know, I would recommend, you know, Google Authenticator or some other soft token. You know, if it's the corporate environment, you know, do do a hard token, an RSA token, you know, something that you're distributing out to the workforce. Uh, but with SMS, now you're relying on the security of the phone system. Uh, and that, that's a huge unknown. And then there's situations where, you know, uh, SIM cards can be, um, uh, you know, it, those can be uh, exploited, or a phone number can actually change from owner to owner. So, so it's nice, you know, for Facebook, that's fine. You know, go ahead if you want to give Facebook your phone number. You know, that that's probably not something, you know, you're going to be hacked unless you're, you know, a celebrity or a government official, but. For two-factor, you know, you really want to focus on, uh, you know, a soft token, a hard token, uh, as well as a password or a PIN. The comment I often hear back when I talk about 2FA is, well, it's a little bit of a pain. It takes longer. And I, I always try to share with people, you need to balance out security versus convenience you're kind of choosing one over the other so even if it does take you a little bit longer and it's a little bit more inconvenient it will provide significant security because when you're trying to clean up post breach it takes time it takes money that's a real disruption that's real inconvenient so i think it's important that everybody realizes take the extra step and if you're not using two-factor authentication read up on it, start implementing it, using it, it becomes second nature, and then it's not that bad. And, and especially, you, you made a great point there, there are different levels of security. If, you, if it's a Facebook or Twitter or something else, that's very public. It, you're probably not divulging anything there. If somebody did ever hack into your account, I had my Twitter account hacked. It was a little bit of mess, but I cleaned it up. Life wasn't over. Uh, it's very different than when somebody hacks your bank account or into your your, your company's network or things like that. Uh, another interesting stat, and this was by um, Thicotic, came across this. Uh, I came across this uh, not too long ago. It was in 2017. They mentioned, at least regarding social network passwords, over 20% of the people admitted they've never changed their password or updated it. So some people will sign up for Facebook three years ago, five years ago, or Twitter or whatever else, they use that simple basic password. And once it's compromised, as you mentioned earlier, it may get out there, they're going to try to see if you reuse that password anywhere. So the dangers are out there, and we really have to to think security uh, and be mindful, whether it's a simple social media account or something even at the, the enterprise level with it within a small business on all levels. We have to think security and have some level of uh, strong passwords. Uh, wh- where do you think, Isaac, I'm curious your thoughts, where do you see the future? I mean, there's a lot of talk, and you, and you touched on a little bit with you know, the, uh, facial recognition, fingerprint, biometric, all these uh, various things of the future. Do you have any pulse or what's your gut telling you what will be adopted in the not too distant future or what you really like i'm curious so where where things look to be heading i mean take a little aside on on biometrics uh you know and and you mentioned face recognition uh as far as i'm concerned you know face id for for apple is actually a convenience factor rather than a security factor you know if you look at it your face isn't a secret you know (laughs) And if somebody really needed to to get into your phone and they had enough drive to do it, it it's, you know, again, you're you're putting a, a boundary up. But depending on who you are, you know, how how strong the drive is, it, it's fairly trivial to create a mask or something that that can get past face ID. Um, and, and if you look at other biometrics, you know, fingerprints, iris scans. I think it's a matter of time before it, it becomes trivial to to actually fake this this information. 
and there's no method to revoke uh, a fingerprint. You know, there there's things they can do on the back end, but you know, how do you change your fingerprints? And that's that's where you are. But as they look at other metrics, uh, you know, heartbeat signatures, uh, movements, you know, the the way that you actually type is very very unique and specific to you. So I think a number of these metrics, you know, um, placement generally, uh, you know, your work or systems know where you are or where you should be. Uh, so looking at, at where the login is coming from, you know, that can be spoofed, but again, it puts up another barrier. So looking at, you know, behavior metrics, uh, they're also looking at, you know, with the phone, how you hold the phone, you know, the subtle movements that you make is things get in biometrics get more complex, uh, they become much, much harder for uh, a hacker to, to mimic. Um, so I think we're looking at that in the far future. In the near future, you know, I just recommend long passwords. I don't worry about complexity, don't worry about composition. Uh, you know, they'll put in that rule that you have to have an uppercase or you have to have a number or you have to have an exclamation mark, you know, uh, some other uh, uh, typographical uh, mark in there. But what users do is just, okay, I'm just going to uppercase the first letter in my password and I'm going to add, you know, a number and a special character at the end. And I'm not really changing, you know, how uncommon my password is. And that's what, you know, that's what hackers know and that's what they look for. Uh, the best thing to do is just to increase the length of your password. Yeah. Uh, so, Adding more to the end of it is going to make it much, much harder uh, to guess or to brute force. Um, the other one, and you, and you mentioned this, is password expiration. And as long as you're using a strong password that hasn't been compromised, there is really no drive to change it. The, definitely, if there's any indication that a password's been compromised, uh, change it. You know, Change that password immediately where, wherever you've used it. Uh, but if the password hasn't been compromised, there, there's no risk involved. And that helps you don't have to learn something new. You don't have to memorize something. Uh, never write it down. Uh, but there, there used to be, um, you know, uh, that, hey, passwords are only good for 30 days. And all that did was drive end users uh, to create easy to guess, easy to memorize passwords. Uh, if the password's strong, if there's no indication that's been compromised, uh, leave it in place indefinitely. Yeah, I'm happy that you said that because I, I, I myself deal with that. Uh, we sell a lot of tools to the, the government. We have to regularly go on, invoice the government, and every 60 days I'm required to change my password. And yes, it's long, long, long and strong but it can be very, very frustrating. And I often thought as I'm sitting there, and sometimes it takes about 10 minutes for me to actually type it all out, as crazy as that sounds. I say, is this compromised? And that's why they're forcing me to again change and update my password. And the natural inclination in myself is just what you said. You almost want to repeat part of it or keep the center of it the middle of the password, something that's easy to remember and easy to type. So we let our guard down quickly, even even as experts in the world of, of security. So it's so important, I think, the point that you made there. Just make sure it's really long. That's even more important than upper and lower and number and, da, 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 and all the alternates. So po point well taken, I think. Um, I do have one uh, final uh, question I, I don't want to neglect asking. I'm curious what your thoughts are on um, password managers. Do, do you personally uh, use them? Do you recommend them? What are the maybe the pros and cons from, from your perspective as an expert? I, I absolutely recommend a password manager. And if you use one, use one that supports copy and paste. Uh, you know, that, that's so. So with a password manager, you're going to protect against shared passwords that, you know, now you you have passwords for multiple systems. You know, if a password for a single system gets compromised, you know, it's not shared across multiple systems. And you can even do it, you know, you, you'll protect against a keylogger because, 
you know, you're just going to do a copy and paste. Nothing's going to be, uh, you know, entered, uh, you know, via the keyboard. Um, absolutely recommend uh, a password manager. I do use a password manager. I fought it for a while. Um, I do keep certain passwords that I do physically write down, lock away in a safe, in a locked office, the, so on and so forth. So I have you know, the physical risk of losing them. But a password manager is so much more convenient, especially as you travel, and it forces you to to keep it organized and keep it secure. And you, and you made a great point, too, there about uh, key loggers. You're not physically typing each keystroke where a, a, a key logger could be taking that and somebody could use that against you because you're cutting and pasting. So really, really great points there that you shared with us. Thank you so much. Um, and, and I wanted to just kind of in, in a, as, as we wrap up here, is there any other points that you wanted to, to maybe share with the audience? And again, uh, maybe even with a focus, what, what, what you and your team is doing there at Excellion? Yeah, actually, there there's one thing you you didn't bring up, and and I do see it going away, but I still run into it uh, on certain systems, is um, never use uh, password hints or security questions. Good point. Absolutely, and and if a system you know forces you to do a security question, take that opportunity to just use it as a secondary password. Never, never answer the question as it's asked. Just remember, hey, that's another secret I need to memorize and put the secret in place. Uh, otherwise, you know, a lot of those security questions, you know, center around public knowledge and they, they open you up to, to, you know, someone being able to hack the system because they know where you went to high school. You know, they know who your, your first grade teacher is. You know, they happen to know your your first pet's name or they just guess that, you know, your first pet's name was Spot. Maybe they got that right. And now they're just a step closer to, to being able to reset your password and get access to your system. Um, you know, moving forward for, for us as a company, it's really, like I said, it's about integrations. You know, so uh, we do we do password management, uh, you know, that if you're adding a, an external user to the system, you know, they're going to be able to, to reset and manage their password. We give the, the admin the controls in place for, you know, password length, any other criteria they need to, to meet for, for their own processes. But we look a lot more at integrating with, you know, external systems. So, you know, like Centrify, uh, RSA, via, you know, via SSO and having a, a centralized system that deals with, uh, you know, identification and and then allows, you know, for multi-factor authentication, not just uh, 2FA or, you know, IP uh, based uh, identification so that, you know, if the user's trying to log into the system from home, you know, send them through multi-factor authentication. But if they're already, you know, on site, uh, they're on the corporate network, then maybe just username password is enough to, to get them access to the system. People want to find out, listeners want to find out more about some of the things that you talked about and what you're involved in. What's the best way to reach you, be it a website, Twitter? I, the, the Excellion website, and it's uh, A-C-C-E-L-L-I-O-N.com. Uh, that is actually the, the best way to, to reach out to me. I mean, feel free to, to connect with me on, on LinkedIn. Uh, that, that works uh, as well. Um, you know, we do have, uh, the Excellion Twitter account, uh, you know, feel, feel free to, to take a look at, you know, what we're doing, what, what we have in, in the works. Um, but yeah, the corporate website, that's, that's the best way to get in touch with me. And you know, like I said, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, you know, so feel free to connect. Great. Well, th thank you again for a great conversation and a lot of great takeaways for our listener. Thank you again, Isaac. Thank you, Scott.